We move on to the next speaker, and we can't escape the day without talking or reflecting on the COVID pandemic. So let's hear more. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation uh, to talk on COVID-19 um, with regards to our experience at Eastern North Hearts. Uh, I was going to talk about the renal care in a pandemic versus endemic and the lessons learned, but I changed a little bit to talk about what our experience was locally at the Eastern North Hearts itself. Uh, I've got no disclosures. Um, what I will talk about is our local experience and try to show the amount of teamwork and the multidisciplinary involvement that was involved in looking after our patients. Not ever may be mentioned, but grateful for the trust, East and North Hearts, and the East of England network for its support it provided to get us through this pandemic. Just to give a little bit of an overview of what we do, we care for patients um, in Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire, and West Essex. We have a hub and spoke model covering four acute. NHS Trust. Uh, the population in our catchment area is about 1.5 million people, and we look after people with acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune conditions, and people who need renal replacement therapy, usually dialysis, transplantation, and supportive care. Our acute transplantation happens in three different centres. One is Addenbrooke's in Cambridge, uh, the Royal Free in London, and the West London Renal Unit. Um, even pre-pandemic, renal replacement therapy needs were increasing over the years. From 2015 up to 2022, you can see growth keeps happening for people with end-stage renal failure needing renal replacement therapy, be it with in-center dialysis, home dialysis, PD, and transplant. This is all our local data, and it's reflected nationally as well. So despite a pandemic where there was high mortality and morbidity, renal failure continues to grow, and we need to provide the best service we can for these group of patients. Our catchment area is quite large. Uh, we are spread out uh, from uh, the south, just above the uh, M25, all the way up uh, to Bedfordshire, and we go from west to east, from Hemel Hempstead, all the way down towards Harlow and the Chelmsford area. So we've got a large geographical area. Our infrastructure for dialysis, um, was not as good as it is at the moment. Uh, we had an acute dialysis unit of five beds, a renal ward of 21 beds. We had 10 out of 50% of, of our critical care was plumbed for dialysis, and we had a list of main dialysis unit with 24 stations. We also had four satellite units, one at the Luton Dunstable Hospital, one at the St. Albans City Hospital, and then we had an offside renal unit on Bedford and one in the Princess Alexander Hospital, with each one having a different number of stations of the capacity for patients. So early in 2020, the unknown happened. Um, COVID-19 was spreading worldwide. Uh, we didn't know what it was going to do. Should we worry? And a lot of people had fear. Um, fear for themselves, fear for family, friends, colleagues, patients, and what would happen next as we progressed through that year. What we did realize was that we had to start planning and thinking about how COVID-19 may affect our patient group. And the patient group we worried about was our in-center dialysis group. Uh, we did models, and it showed that without any major intervention, 80% of our dialysis patients would get infected. Um, so we have the most vulnerable group, one of the most vulnerable groups of patients in a healthcare setting. Uh, patients need to come for their treatment. Uh, it's life-saving treatment for them. They have to come for their dialysis or they need to come for their urgent procedures and treatments, which could be renal access surgery, investigations such as kidney biopsies, and have chemotherapy treatment for them. Uh, so these patients couldn't isolate or they couldn't um, stay at home during lockdown periods. They had to come out into the communities and into hospitals where there's potential risk of exposure to COVID-19 and becoming unwell from it. So we had to operationalize what we did um, to protect our patient groups. So with senior management, we started the daily COVID-19 management group in, in the renal department led by the clinical director and by the uh, renal head uh, of nursing. We increased our out-hour covers for, for renal senior cover uh, 
for seven days a week and we had a pandemic medical ro rotor. This is support critical care, it was to increase the renal bed base for the expected increase of renal failure and to support acute medical admissions. We had to redistribute our workforce into different areas and different professions to help, to help um, across what was going to be a very difficult time in the country. But what we realized quite early on that infection prevention and control was probably the single most important measure. And even prior to government advice, we realized that patients needed to reduce the exposure by coming out of the community. They needed to shield. Face masks became a priority. And we implemented that across all our dialysis units quite early on before it became mandatory nationally. We used standard PPE and we encouraged patients to self-transport to avoid exposing themselves in patient transport services. We started temperature and symptom screening as well. So we had to think about how could we reduce transmission? What were the other aspects we could do? Could we, we, we thought increasing of social distancing was probably one of the key aspects and increasing our isolation capacity to dialyze patients, to dialyze if they were infected or suspected of being infected away from the general dialysis population. So we did a few things. So to reduce or increase social distancing, uh, one of the things we did quite early on was to try, try to reduce our patients from three times a week dialysis to twice a week dialysis. This will reduce their overall exposure risk uh, in the community uh, or in hospital settings to COVID-19. Incremental dialysis is a part of our unit culture. We measure residual renal function monthly. So we were able to identify patients who could manage for short periods of time from three times a week going down to twice a week. And during the peak of the pandemic, our proportion of patients who dialyze twice a week increased from eight to 10% up to nearly 30%. We also freed up isolation capacity um, through the review of patient isolation requirements to try to ensure we had the right patients in the right areas. We reschedule appointments across the day to improve the gap of time between dialysis shifts to allow patients not to cross over and increase the risk of transmission between shifts of dialysis. We cleared an evening shift initially in the main unit in case we had COVID positive patients to dialyze them in isolation in, in the evening. And we even had plans in place to open up dialysis units at night and to do night dialysis to avoid patients who may be infected with COVID-19 um, from dialyzing with the general population. Then we also thought of creating a COVID unit, but logistically that is extremely difficult when you have very high capacity uh, of patients. So our stations are used at 99% capacity. There's barely any give in the way to move patients around uh, to create a whole COVID unit. We looked at cohorting patients in bays and shifts according to their postcodes, because if there's an increased incidence related to a postcode, those patients then would be in the same region and the risk would be the same as where they lived. And the main thing which helped us get through the COVID-19 pandemic is actually sourcing an isolation facility. So what we did was, it's a, we called it the Florence unit. What we did was, uh, we actually craned in porter cabins in the front of the hospital, which were all connected together uh, and made side rooms or isolation rooms for dialysis in this, in, in this built porter cabin area. We plumbed it with water. We kitted it out with um, dialysis chairs, um, IPC equipment, separate dialysis machines, and we delivered dialysis in isolation for patients who were suspected to have COVID-19 or had COVID-19 who were well enough and not need to be in, hosp in hospital. Sorry, so this is, this is just a few pictures to show um, how it worked. Uh, we had a nursing station in the middle. We had eight dialysis side rooms, um, which provided uh, one side to be suspected patients and another side to be patients who are already COVID-19 positive. 
Um, and I think without this, with our infrastructure at East and North Hearts, we wouldn't have got through the pandemic. Another thing that happened during the pandemic is the recognition of increased acute kidney injury requiring renal replacement therapy and multi-organ failure of patients with COVID-19. Um, there was this worry and there was a lack of materials to provide hemofiltration on critical care units. So they were not able to get kits or the fluid to provide renal replacement therapy for critically ill patients on critical care. So we had to improve our infrastructure to allow us to use alternative ways to provide renal replacement therapy on uh, our critical care areas. So what we did is we put in um, water equipment were installed, we put uh, water plants, we put uh, water rings into all our critical care areas, including an augmented new critical care areas in our trust to deal with the pandemic. And this allowed us to provide hemodialysis in all critical care beds. And these are with the team and the nursing team who went in and out to the COVID-19 areas to provide hemodialysis for our patients who are on critical care, as well as we also uh, developed a protocol for very gentle, slow, low efficient dialysis on critical care for more patients who are more unstable with multi-organ failure. This was called SLED-F. So we successfully collaborated with the critical care to implement this, and this saved hemofiltration resources when there were high demands during the pandemic. This is kind of a summary of the major structural infrastructural changes we did. Our isolation dialysis unit, where its peak was dialyzing 52 patients without having to activate further renal surge plans. We increased our dialysis infrastructure in hospital. Our critical care went from 10, 10 to 32 spaces on the critical care, which could provide dialysis. And we increased our ward areas to be able to provide bedside dialysis by nearly 50%. And we became a regional referral center to manage COVID-19 patients with end-stage renal failure and acute kidney injury. So another thing that was important during the pandemic was to look at transport and how we could reduce the risk to patients that they could be transmitting infections, getting cross infections in transport. So the simplest ways were if patients were able to self-transport, if friends or family within the same uh, social bubbles could could transport them. We got named volunteer drivers for named patients, so they had the same volunteer driver who would drive them in for dialysis. Um, and we worked closely with the patient transport service um, to develop relationships, links, and more efficient transport services for renal patients. During the pandemic, the demand for patient transport had gone down due to less outpatient activity and other specialities, which meant that actually we could prioritize renal transport. Um, now, post pandemic, um, renal transport may not ha has gone back to pre pandemic uh, levels, but we are working closely with the patient transport service to improve this because it's one of the key aspects, I think, to the patient experience uh, when they come from dialysis. Now, home therapies um, is a very important area which actually protected patients. So patients who did not have to come in to hospital three times a week uh, and do the treatments at home had, were less likely to get infections. So patients who were in PD or home hemodialysis, it really protected them. So we carried on doing home dialysis training, except during peak times where staff had to be redeployed to manage in center areas. And the reason we carried on home therapies was to keep having patients to continue their home dialysis. And over the first year, we managed to still have 50 new patients go on to a home dialysis program. Transplantation uh, continued during the pandemic. Adam Brooks was one of the few centers nationally to remain open for transplantation during the pandemic. And in that year, we had a good year still with 67 patients who were transplanted. Unfortunately, transplant workup for patients who on renal replacement therapy had to be put on hold um, because we did not have the staffing and we had to re 
uh, redeploy the staff to help out with other critical areas. Now, Dialysis is one aspect, but there are other aspects where we support patients, our transplant patients, our patients with advanced kidney care patients. So they were isolating, but they still needed to be monitored and managed and have a variety of different aspects of the care delivered. Bringing them to face-to-face -face clinics did increase their risk sitting in large groups. So we introduced lots of virtual working to try to support the patients in the community. But we, we did have key patients or patients who needed face-to-face -face reviews to be reviewed in our green sites, as we call them. So sites which are not on acute trust, sites where they were less likely to come to unwell people who may have COVID-19. Um, we introduced virtual home visits for um, via the renal support team and advanced kidney care team. And we also had dedicated phlebotomy and vaccination clinics for advanced kidney care patients. So this took them away from the general population coming in for a variety of different tests and investigations and reducing their risk. In terms of pharmacy, we started a service where we could deliver drugs out to patients. So any changes we, we made for patients, we delivered the drugs out to them. They didn't have to come out to get them. And this included things such as erythropoietin and immunosuppressive medications. Now, this is just a picture of, of the team working at the desk, working hard to try to communicate with patients and each other in trying to, to help provide a virtual service and a variety of different comments from, from patients uh, who found it very useful. It saved them time in terms of driving, it saved them parking. Um, so I think virtual working is extremely important um, in, the, in the long term and we should keep it going. Um, but there will be patients that we need to see physically because you cannot gain the same level of care and rapport over phone sometimes. Um, I would like to talk about our renal support team. So during the pandemic, there was an increased number of social referrals. Uh, patients had financial difficulties, loss of employment, housing issues, anxiety. Our social workers were, were proactive in contacting all COVID positive patients and family um, and in and our counselling service as well in contacting the bereaved um, who may or may not have had COVID as well. Um, and what we found was that this is a very much appreciated service during the pandemic. And we found that actually during the pandemic, despite other areas reducing the amount of outpatient activity, our outpatient activity actually increased, showing the increased support we provided for, for our group of patients. Another important aspect during the pandemic was screening of our patients uh, in the dialysis units. What we did know, there, a lot, there were quite a few patients who were asymptomatic, so they may have had the infection but not had any symptoms. And by being in the general population, they would end up transmitting it to other patients who potentially could become unwell. When we had an increased incidence of COVID-19 quite early on in one of our units, we started a screening program and once we start the screening program, taking finding asymptomatic patients and taking them out of the patient group, so isolating and dialyzing them, resulted in less new infections happening in the unit. So since then, we've implemented asymptomatic screening in all our dialysis units, um, and staff have been doing lateral flow testing twice a week. Vaccination and majority of people will know about vaccination and how vaccination has turned the tide and protected uh, the community uh, and the people from this virus. Um, we found that quite early on we were believers in vaccination and we took days out in the week to book a whole vaccination hub, so our own hub at the East and North Hearts Lister Hospital, where we went out and got 400 of our patients to be vaccinated because we felt this was an important aspect of their care and protection for them. So over that first year, a variety of different things happened. We had a large amount of input to our patient groups. What I really wanted to show was in terms of a benefits advisor. So a lot of people did go through hardships. Our the support that we had with the specialist benefit advisor during that time allowed nearly £400,000 worth of benefits to be secured for patients who needed it. And I think this is 
extremely welcomed in the patient group. And there's a few comments uh, here for, 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 for how they felt uh, with the support that they had. Another aspect that came on uh, end of last year was about COVID extended therapy. So these are treatments given to patients who early on in the infection who are high risk from to becoming unwell. Uh, these drugs reduce the risk of the patients needing hospital admission. We work closely with our with the local CMDUs. These are the hubs which deliver these medications, and we collaborated with them to be able to provide the treatments to our renal transplant patients and our dialysis patients. And we deliver these treatments either in the dialysis unit or in the local CMDUs. One thing which I'm quite proud of the team, despite a pandemic, um, we still had to help patients who are in an extremely difficult situation. This is a patient who had a total artificial heart during wave three of the pandemic. Uh, he was an inpatient at the Harfield Hospital for three months, and he was deemed unfit for hemodialysis as an outpatient. Our home therapies team went, saw him, reviewed him there. They worked closely with the Harfield team, the cardiology team out there, and we started a program of training him for home hemodialysis on one of our main dialysis units till him and his family were able to do it. And he had six months at home having outpatient dialysis. Without this, his life would have been shortened and he wouldn't have had the time to spend with his family. So despite a pandemic, there are quite a lot of innovative things that we can do to help our patient group. Skip that bit. Sorry. Um, I always like to show pictures of the team uh, and uh, the workforce. I think our workforce and our people in the NHS are our key resource. No matter how many machines I have or how many bed spaces I have, without the people, we won't be able to function. We won't be able to deliver the service we do uh, to help uh, the community. And my favorite one is one of my nursing colleagues on the top, on the left hand side there, who quite early on the pandemic, when the whole hospital was full of uh, patients with COVID-19, we had nowhere to dialyze, nowhere to dialyze this COVID-19 patient who was desperately of need of hemodialysis. We took around a port, one of our portable machines down to the ED department into one of the cubicles and started their treatment there. And this is not part of normal practice. Um, I think it's the innovation and the drive of the team to provide care and keep patients safe and deliver what we can is, is, is key in first progressing and improving services. And I've got a multitude of pictures of the team working hard over the last two, three years, and they've always got smiles on their faces. Uh, and I'm very proud of this team that I work with. And the work we do allows us to enable our patients to reach their life goals. We work very closely with the Lister Area Kidney Patient Association. Um, they recognized um, the collaborative working uh, that uh, the team do and presented us this token of appreciation to the whole team. And we are immensely grateful to them uh, for the close working relationship we have because together we can make things better. I'm not going to talk about all the different lessons learned here. I've kind of summarized it during my talk. Um, I hope uh, that was informative and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Oh, thank you very much. So we've got a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is what is being done now to protect patients? As we know, there's a new wave of COVID. It's never going to go away and people are still shielding. So officially, I guess we all know from the government, shielding is not really there. We do know our patient group is vulnerable. Vaccination is still key. The type of vaccinations that come out um, are uh, augmented to help protect our patient group. Um, if you look now at the patients who are coming into hospital with COVID-19, actually they're not falling as sick. And there's a big stark difference compared to wave one and wave two. Um, usually most patients are being picked up at the moment are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms, which reassures me that actually COVID-19 
and the resilience of the human body and the protection we've had from vaccination is actually the key aspect we need to have. So for me, ensuring that we keep vaccination rates high is a key protective measure. Well, I think you just answered the question that's just come in, really. How confident are you with the winter coming up with COVID and protection? So I think it's not just COVID-19 that's the issue. I think it is a system with a large need of acute services and support services in the community. Uh, I think the demand is growing. Uh, I mean, I've showed you a graph right at the beginning about the, about the growth of just renal replacement therapy. But if you look across the country and other different specialities and needs, you can see the growth is happening in all areas. And it's it's a basic element is resource availability to deliver that. And I don't think the resource availability is matching demand growth. Now, last question for you. Does COVID impact kidney function? Um, so you'll see a variety of different things there. So COVID-19 has, we did see a lot of COVID-19 related acute kidney injury. Um, COVID-19 also brought to the forefront of other conditions. So it seems to sometimes people who are more prone to immune related issues. It may precipitate that or make it more apparent. Um, anyone who's sick from any infection can develop a kidney injury, which then results in them having complete kidney failure or chronic kidney disease, or if they're lucky, completely resolve and be back to normal renal function. So in summary, yes. Thank you very much for your time.